We live in a constantly changing world where the speed of information is changing how we think and act and connect with one another. When people in a society lose faith in their institutions, in God and in each other, the nation collapses. We need help rebuilding trust and tying it all together. Welcome to All That To Say, a podcast exploring the interrelatedness of all things in long-form conversation. Steve Brolier, author of Mitka's Secret, a true story of child slavery and surviving the Holocaust, joins Jim Lyon to explore the life of a writer and the power and hope in Mitka's story of survival. Steve Brawlier, welcome to All That to Say. Thank you, Jim. So good to see you. Uh, let's just have full disclosure here. Steve and I have some history uh, for most of a lifetime, actually. And uh, so good to catch up with you, Steve, as you have opened a new chapter, pun intended, <laughs> as an author, which was not really the sum of your life professionally until recent years, as you've given yourself to uh, telling a story, which I want to get to in a minute. But right now, it's just so glad to see you here and just to hear a little bit about where you've been. And Steve, if if I were to go survey some people that you know, and uh, they were to be asked, reflect on Steve Brawyer, uh, who is that guy? What would they say? What do you think they'd say? I realize it's a bit of an awkward question because... Uh, what you want them to say may not be what you actually think they'll say, but what what do you think people would say about you? Um, gosh, that is a, an awkward question for anybody to talk about themselves, I think. But um, there, as you touched on, what I would hope they would say, and uh, I think I can capture that in perhaps a story. I went off to college, and when I graduated, um, my parents lived a long way away, in fact, across the country. And they didn't have great means, and, but they wanted to acknowledge my graduation. They couldn't come back. Uh, they sent me $300 with a specific purpose in mind. It was that I would buy a suit because they knew I would be looking for a job. Um, and they knew you didn't have one. <laughs> that, they absolutely knew. <laughs> that, you, that you hadn't invested there before. No. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, so I went downtown in Ithaca, New York, to a men's clothing store, and I, tr I trusted the salesman to help me find a suit. Um, it had a, I think this kind of says it all, it was a silver wool suit with a window pane that was a maroon color, it put me in a maroon shirt, and, um, uh, and, a, and a silver tie. So you can understand. Well, what that says is the 1970s. Well, actually, in this case, yes, it does. It does. But in this case, it was also uh, my lack of social capital. And, uh, you know, I should have been in a blazer and, uh, or a, a Navy suit, et cetera. Um, so, but there was another aspect to that, that um, my resume, I wrote my resume. I didn't have any help with it. And in the line that says objective, my objective said that I wanted to serve God and serve man, um, and that, or something to that effect. And then I'm off to New York to apply for work at NBC and so forth. And uh, you can imagine that uh, my earnestness and my desires um, probably shouldn't have been on that resume. Uh, but nevertheless, that, that I think is part of what um, I would want people to say about me, that um, Steve tried uh, to do the right thing, and he wanted to do the right thing. Um, that he was in the arena, um, you know, to think of Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, that I failed s at times, but that he was sincere and, and wanted to serve God in those things. And you've had a storied career, actually. Uh, and as I hear you describe yourself graduating from college and setting foot in the big world, um, the Lord did have his hand on your life, Steve. That's what I think, and still does. You went to Cornell. Uh, that's not just a second string uh, educational establishment. That is a top tier school. You went there as an athlete. What were you doing athletically then? Uh, it, I was a runner. 
I was on the West Coast, um, Vancouver, Washington, and uh, I was a half miler and a miler, and there was this uh, engineer in Palo Alto who was also a graduate of Cornell, and he made it his hobby to follow student athletes because in the Ivy League they don't give out athletic scholarships, but they're trying to identify some mm -hmm. athletes. And uh, I had scholarships to a couple of the Pac-10 schools, Pac-10 at the time, uh, UC Davis and uh, Oregon State and Washington State. But there was he identified me as someone that Cornell was interested in, and I didn't know a thing about that at the time. Um, but that's how that came about. I got on a plane in San Francisco and flew to Kennedy and then helicoptered to uh, LaGuardia and took Slow Hawk, as they lovingly <laughs> called Mohawk Airlines, uh, up to Ithaca and began this. I mean, it was a pretty scary thing for this, you know, this kid out of Vancouver, Washington, but that's how it began. And you ran for them. I ran for them. I ran, um, yeah, there was some remarkable things. It took me to the Penn Relays in Philadelphia, to a historic venue, to um, Madison Square Garden several times in New York, and to uh, all over all the Ivy League schools. And the Florida Relays, gosh, you know, we're an Ivy League school, so we're not supposed to compete against the big boys. <laughs> but at the Florida Relays, our two-mile relay team, which I was the leadoff runner, um, for a few months, we had the best time in the nation until the NC2A championships. And uh, so it was, you know, there were some little glory moments there. But yeah, but, yeah, I mean, lots of things to celebrate. Mm -hmm. And as your career developed, you found yourself landing in music. I mean, implausibly, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. The half-miler from Cornell, who dreams of NBC, ends up ultimately in Nashville by way of uh, other parts of the Midwest, helping to develop and promote and stage some very influential music. I mean, it was a career uh, for a long, long time, Steve, starting with who? Oh, gosh. Uh, yes, it was, and it was unexpected. And it started with Bill Gaither. Um, who's probably familiar to many in this audience. Um, I was a 24-year-old. Um, I was working at Anderson University, oddly enough. and um, That's on the northeast side of Indianapolis. It is. And Bill lives nearby, Bill he and does. Gloria Gaither. Yes. And I had started writing a little in-house piece for the university that, uh, you know, it was to keep the university faculty and staff and so forth up on. And the president asked me to, if I would send that to trustees, of which Bill Gaither happened to be one of those. Um, so I did. And one day my secretary came in and said, Steve, Bill Gaither's on the phone. And I, I really didn't have much sense of who he was at the time. Um, and uh, he said, we had a conversation. He said, I'd like you. I've been reading what you've been writing. Would you write a press release for me? I'll give you 50 bucks. And <laughs> I wrote two of them. Um, subsequently, he asked me to write a, a, a paper about how he should promote his concerts. I didn't know a thing about how to promote concerts, but I dove into the task and um, wrote a six-page paper and about... And that kind of launched my career as a concert promoter. And I began promoting, at that time, 70 concerts a year. And um, then subsequently there was this young 17-year-old in Nashville who in high school touched a nerve across America with a song called My Father's Eyes. And uh, that was Amy Grant. And so I got to promote her first three tours so there's been a lot of, you know, I've been the, the one who got to witness a lot of yes. these things passing oh. by. And not just a passive player either. I mean, backstage, the public wouldn't see you necessarily. No. But backstage, uh, the trajectories of people like Bill and Gloria Gaither, who still today are towering figures in gospel music, uh, Amy Grant, who has a gospel music career and a crossover into secular pop, I mean... And, and we could go on and on. You found yourself in the middle of a, 
of a heady environment with a lot of uh, fascinating characters and stories, and and it's a whole world. And you have retired from that now and found yourself writing a book. And I'm interested how that developed. How did you move from this kind of uh, concert promotion, music, musical staging, which is itself a, a bit of a storytelling, I guess. I mean, when you think about someone who really communicates in music, if they're not communicating a story, whether it be their own or maybe some kind of narrative, uh, it probably doesn't last or fly too long. So there's a storytelling aspect of that, but now you're telling a story. Mm. Now you're, you're actually the person who is the storyteller. How did that develop? How do you see yourself moving from one to the other? I think that there was always a seed in me to want to write. Um, there's also a perfectionist side of me, and so uh, I, I didn't have the courage to write uh, much, certainly not to put something in front of anybody as a young man. So I would write things uh, and put them away in a file. And uh, I loved words, I loved ideas, I loved storytelling, I loved the rhythm and the music of putting words in combination with each other. So that was always there. Um, but uh, I didn't, I didn't, well, I sim simply I didn't have the courage to do that at that time. Uh, so uh, years go by, um, you know, children come into the picture and uh, career and so forth and so on. Uh, I retired in 2012 and uh, I thought I retired. I really didn't <laughs> retire. You changed, uh, yes. changed assignments. <laughs> yes. um, so I thought, well, gosh, I'm going to... Uh, I had an idea uh, that uh, came out of uh, really, I won't go into the long and the, uh, story here, but uh, the, the idea was how, if I needed to, could I escape and become invisible in society, which is the flip of what we all want, of course. But if one was in trouble, serious trouble, and... Uh, I do it. How disappear. Do you, yes. How do you do that in this digital world where if you make a mark in anything, it's in cement? Um, so that became the idea that propelled a whole story forward. And, and um, I was in the midst of finishing that novel. Uh, Which is named? Then We Will Know. And uh, it's a terrific, terrific piece of... I, I, I love the whole idea, but I was in, uh, almost at the f end of that. I was in Stockton, California with my wife, who is a dean at a university there. And um, one night we're walking in our neighborhood, and uh, we came across one of her faculty members, Joel Lohr, uh, who's this towering six foot eight, 150 pound guy, but uh, <laughs> a, a really bright mind. And he said, Steve, I've got some questions to ask you. I know you've been at the William Morris Agency. I've got some business questions to ask about something. Let's go down the, uh, to the neighborhood uh, restaurant here, have a hamburger, and let's talk this over. We got into this discussion uh, about a story that immediately I was thinking, wow, this is an incredible story. I answered his questions about the business and legal aspects uh, that he brought to the table. And then at the end of the conversation, I said something bold. I, it, I was kind of surprised it even came out of my mouth. And I said, you know, would you consider me as the writer of this story? I'll send you some writing samples. And uh, he said, uh, we'll consider it. And uh, a week and a half later, I got this call from him and said, you know, let's take this to the next step. And you find yourself now on the threshold of why we are really here to talk today about this new book that has recently been released, this story. But before we get there, I'm hearing you say that you didn't have confidence in your own writing or, or, or maybe the courage or the, or the sense of self that I could write something that other people really would want to read or certainly, I'm not sure they'd purchase it. But in that, you experimented in a way and, and put your toe in the water, wrote a, a novel, a work of fiction that is a great narrative. Now you find yourself in the 
cusp or, or maybe becoming the custodian of a real life story mm. that has not before been told. And you're placed in the moment to help bring that story to a broader audience outside of one house, yeah. outside of a very narrow uh, pericope. And it's just so striking because uh, in, a, in a very eventful life, Steve, uh, where you just referenced out of hand the William Morris Agency, which is one of the nation's most premier uh, agencies in the entertainment world, uh, both in publishing and in staging and music and so on. Uh, and all of those things where you have done great things, this thing, this mm -hmm. book, may in fact have the greatest lasting impact. That's just my bit of prophecy here. That said, when you write... Do you like writing? Is it, is it something that's life-giving for you? Or do you find it tedious or challenging or exhausting? And the reason I'm asking is, I've had people tell me that I write well, and I do. I, I know I can put words together on a page, and I can do it in a compelling and elegant way. I, I'll be so boastful as to say that. But for me, it is exhausting. It is, It just drains me. Mm -hmm. I'm always good when it's over, but I feel like, Mac, Michelangelo after the Sistine Chapel. Well, that's really a pretentious comparison, isn't it? But, but you know, after all this over, the agony, the exile of it, I can look back on it and say, well, yeah, that was good. But the prospect of doing it is so daunting, I don't do it often. Now, I'm, I'm just throwing my, I'm projecting my own angst on you. For you, writing, is it something that gives you life or you approach with dread or a sense of expectation? How would you describe it? I'm reminded of uh, of something I read one time that Ernest Hemingway said about writing, which was, it's like opening an artery and bleeding. Mm. Um, writing is hard. It's really hard. Um, part of the difficulty is beginning. They say beginning is half done. <laughs> yes. And uh, sitting down and... Uh, you know, there's the famous blank page. Um, I find writing uh, really difficult at so many levels. Um, one is establishing the habit of writing daily. A discipline. A discipline. Habits, we establish bad habits rather easily. Um, it's hard to establish good habits. So that discipline is, is, has been critical. Uh, and I come and go with it. I have difficulty. I write on my back porch mostly. I write late at night, um, usually starting about 10. Um, I find that um, when I get into it, I will look up and four hours have passed. Uh, and I... That is really, really wonderful when that happens. Um, and, and that happens quite often. It's just once you begin, um, mm -hmm. I'm riding away. My perfectionist nature, uh, you know, I've had to learn to write fast and understand that rewriting is an maybe the most important part of writing. Um, I, you know, some chapters that I've written have gone through 19 iterations. Um, Others go through four, but they all have to be rewritten. So I've learned not to fall in love with the sentence the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, and uh, it, it does bring me great joy. I found that writing nonfiction was much more difficult for me than writing fiction, because in fiction um, I can enjoy being in my own head. And the creativity of that, in nonfiction, I was having to pull these disparate parts together, and it, it felt like a thousand puzzle pieces on the table, and which one goes where? Hmm. Oh, that makes so much sense, and very insightful. And I, I was listening to your talk, and I, I think I hear you saying that it's hard to get started sometimes, but there are moments when it's like a faucet turned on, mm. and it just pours out. It is. And then you might make some splash on the floor and have to do some cleanup. But, yeah. <laughs> but nevertheless, the fire hydrant uh, is, is really the core of it. And then you polish it later. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about uh, so far unnamed is a book mm -hmm. that is now 
uh, on sale, published by Erdmans, which is a very uh, outstanding publisher. And it's called Mitka's Secret. And it has a subtitle. What's the subtitle, Steve? It is A True Story of Child Slavery and Surviving the Holocaust. Right, now let's just stop right there. Child slavery, uh, the Holocaust, and actually the word secret. Those are, for me, very evocative concepts. Uh, my mind races, uh, maybe because we're all informed at some level of each of those things. We all understand a secret at, at some place. We've probably all got some secrets, sometimes disclosed and sometimes still held by us alone. We understand child slavery if from afar we've read a story, a news piece, there's a lot of buzz, if I could use the term, about human trafficking these days, about the, the buying and selling or the, uh, the merchandising of human flesh. Uh, the Holocaust, uh, a very powerful word, uh, sometimes controversial in some segments of society, but also a draconian piece of history, modern history, that all of us living today are close enough to, in the mid-20th century, to have, well, some, some grasp in a way different than ancient time. All of that converges in the story, which is a true story. And then there is the name Mitka. All of these concepts are captured in his journey. Tell us about Mitka. Now, you've just... You've kind of walked us uh, into a hamburger luncheon <laughs> where you've been introduced to the story by a mutual friend or a friend of your wife or a coworker of your wife. And as you hear the story then, that's your first taste of it, something inside of you says, man, I think, I think maybe I want to help tell this story. And, yeah. and one door leads to another. And you're introduced to Mitka and you find yourself trusted by him to tell the story. With that set up, who is Mitka? Well, immediately I recognized, or I, I, you know, I thought, gosh, this is a story that just doesn't come by every day. Um, Mitka is a fascinating man. He is, um, first of all, he's now probably in his late 80s. Uh, it was a daunting idea to think about writing about a living human being. Um, Mitka is a very compelling personage. When you see him, you're drawn to him in ways that you can't really explain. He has he, a kind of charisma. Unique. He has an extraordinary charisma. Um, he's a large and very strong man. Um, he's uh, got piercing blue eyes, but there's something else that defies analysis as to why you're drawn to him. Um, it, certainly it's his story that uh, has made him who he is. Um, and um, it's just uh, uh, the story and who he is all came together in two days in Sparks, Nevada, where he and his wife live. Uh, my wife and I were there and, and spending time with them. The, the story is extraordinary, but it, it was matched in, hi, in, in him. Um, and you, you just said, this, is, this has some, some magic, really, um, in, the, in this whole mix. And magic is a word I associate with Tinkerbell. And, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know the, the wonderful world of Disney. Yeah. When actually, you're talking about magic, it, it has a certain compelling power yeah. to engage even though the story mm. could be determined by some, certainly mm. in the first act of the story, to be very dark. What is the story? Yeah. Where did he come from? Mm. And what happened to him? A lot of stories have been told about Holocaust survivors. And he is one. And he is one. Um, this story had something that hadn't been told before, and that was the story of a child slave. Um, enslaved by a Nazi. But let me back up a little bit and give a little... Can I give a little yes, overview absolutely. of the absolutely. story? Absolutely. Um, as a four-year-old, Metka was dropped at a kinderheim, uh, you know, a school, but a boarding school of sorts, in Bilosirkva, Ukraine. He's Ukrainian. 
We don't know that. That's where he showed up at four years old, anyway. Yes. Uh, he was uh, dropped off there because he was a Jewish boy. If you were not Jewish and had a Jewish boy in your home, or even if you were, uh, you, you, you knew at that time that your life was in danger and your whole family's life. This was 1939. So the, the Nazis had already invaded Ukraine. No. Not, this is before that. This, this was the fall of 1939. In September 1st, they invaded Poland. That was their first uh, announcement to the world that yes. we're going to you know, be this hegemon all yeah. over Europe. Yeah. Um, he spent two years at this orphanage, quasi-school boarding place. He knew that because of the passage of seasons. That's how he measured time. Um, there wasn't instruction going on. They were, you know, more than warehousing kids. There was some care. But after two years, um, one day some of the teachers left, and uh, the children were left there alone. And there was an age range from, you know, Metka, four years old, to some teens probably, Mitka left to go find teachers after about a week, but he left on the occasion of Bielusirkva being bombed. Hitler was coming through the Ukraine to get to Russia in Operation Barbarossa. They dropped five bombs on the area right around the school. Ceiling plaster is falling on Mitka, his bedclothes are on the floor or his sheets. He leaves with another boy to go find teachers. The two boys part at a road, never to see each other again. Metka couldn't find any teachers. He went into the woods and lived alone. The next day after he left, for the first time in the Nazi history, they took all the children in that school, they marched them into the forest and executed children for the first time. Mitka, for the first time in his life, escaped death by that. Um, the Eisengruppen were the killing squads that carried that out, with local soldiers, Ukrainian soldiers also involved, common people. Mitka spent time in the, the forest scavenging for food. Now, think about a six-year-old boy. A six-year-old, <laughs> yeah. just surviving. Ah, And he's not even sure where he came from. I mean, he... His Doesn't memory know. seems to kind of begin at age four when, with the school. Well, at he, the has, time. he has little snippets of memory that are before that. But yes, that's where they really began. Uh, he is picked up by Germans after spending some time helping a woman with her cow for it's other things in the woods and so yeah. forth. He's picked up by Germans. And again, um, in this instance, he is lined up with other Jews thousands of them, uh, at a ravine, and they are executing one after another and falling into the ravine. This little boy decides to fall into the ravine before they get to him. He has the wits about him yes. to, to fake his own death. Yes. I mean, think about that at age six. And he's covered in bodies when it's all said and done. And when it gets silent, he finds a way out of the bodies on top of him. And he crawls back out, and once again he gets picked up by Germans, German soldiers, and he gets put on uh, the infamous cattle cars. He makes a 600-mile journey in a cattle car in which he cannot sit down. He is standing on what we would think of as a bathroom scale, that kind of mm -hmm. size, and you're held up by the shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder contact. The crowd. The crowd. Yeah. There is no... You, you use the restroom as you stand, that is. And uh, so for 600 miles, with some stops where they throw the dead bodies off, he begins uh, his first uh, concentration camp is Birkenau, Auschwitz. Then he goes to uh, Buchenwald. Then he goes to Dachau. Finally, he is sent to a camp called Pfaffenwald, which Pfaffenwald wasn't even known to the German people or the world until 1984, when a German scholar wrote about it. 
Uh, Metka was likely one of two survivors of that camp. And uh, it was a place where they took um, pregnant displaced persons, prisoners, and other prisoners who couldn't work as forced labor anymore because they were so sick or so malnourished and so forth. And they were killed there bef- after they were experimented on in medical experimentation, of which happened to Mitka. One day, Mitka is taken out of the camp, and he's taken out by the man that became his slaveholder for seven years. How Gustav. old would he be at the time? He would be seven. At seven, yeah. okay. Probably seven and a half. I mean, these are all some... Speculative because he doesn't really have a calendar, he does doesn't he? doesn't have a birth date. Yeah. On that day, December uh, 14, um, he was given a birth date by Gustav Iron Gustav Dürer, who became his slave holder, he was given a birth that day as his birth date in 1932. That the year was a fiction, but he needed him to be 10 years old uh, because it was legal to have forced labor, child forced labor in your home if you were 10 years old. So that became his de facto birth date. He spent seven years in this. Uh, Rotenberg on the Fulda in this compound that was a farm and a house, a three-story house in that town. And you say he's a child slave, meaning he says he is a slave. He serves his master, whatever the ask, whatever the drama, whatever the hardship. He has no voice. He simply accommodates the master. It, let me give you a little sense of what that meant. He, the first night, or the first day that he arrives there, uh, he is stripped naked in front of the family with which he'll be staying, he's seven and a half, and he's put in a tub and he's scrubbed. Uh, He remembers abrasions on his body from how hard he was scrubbed, but he hadn't, he, he, as far as he can recall, he'd never had a bath. He'd never had a shower except when he was at Dachau and they deliced him with other uh, naked women, which terribly embarrassed him. But this was the first time he'd ever been scrubbed. Um, He was wearing rags when he came and he was put into uh, some kind of a tunic with a pair of pants. He had no shoes. He was given no shoes. He had no belt. He, in the seven years he was there, he had never had underwear. He was put into a room in the house um, and locked. Um, every night he returned to that room. He slept on straw. He had a horse blanket uh, to get through the windows. It was an unheated room. Um, he began doing the work of a grown man very early on. He took care of the farm animals, uh, which were two horses, a cow, which he milked morning and night, uh, some goats, uh, chickens, collecting eggs from the chickens. Um, and he, one of his tasks, they had a, this is a funny story, they had a double-story uh, outhouse at the house. Um, and he makes a lot of fun out of that. But it was his job to take all of the human waste down to fields that Gustav Dürr owned for fertilizer and to take all the waste from the farmyard animals down there. He would ride in a wagon, drive a wagon, and unload that, mm-hmm. spread it on the fields. Those were some of the kinds of tasks that he did over and over and over, and over again. He was never taught anything. He never knew what a toothbrush was. He didn't have any clue. Um, he uh, ate what he fed the animals. Um, He would mix slop for the pigs, and that's what his diet consisted of. Uh, So it was a very... uh, It's a horrific story of childhood abuse and slavery. And as as the war ends, and uh, he's ultimately uh, freed uh, by, what, American GIs? Yes. Um, In 19... Uh, 49, um, beginning of that year, UNRWA, which was a relief organization um, at that time, was 
identifying displaced persons. There were four and a half million of them at the, at, right after the war um, moving around Germany, and many of them were children. Um, so they had been trying to place people where they came from and with family and so forth. They had been following Metka, uh, unbeknownst to him or to anybody, really. Um, and somehow they identified this boy in this German home. And in this was four years after, after the, the, war. the war. He's they still enslaved. Him. Think yes. about that. Yeah. Yeah. And so there came a point where he was uh, really rescued by American GIs. He thought, because he'd always seen the American GIs as enemies. That's what he had been told. Sure. He didn't even know the war was over. He thought he was going to be taken back to. This is now uh, about a 14-year-old boy who weighs 100, and, 100 pounds and is five foot three and is malnourished and can't read and has the social um, capacity of... Uh, he was described by social workers at the time as being infantile in his development. Uh, so he's taken to a camp... Um, in Bavaria called the Children's Village at Bad Eibling, which had been uh, an Air Force base for the Germans before the Americans took it over. And um, uh, he is kept there for two years. And they're the wonderful Quaker workers who are just, they still, I, I get so inspired by their high ideals for the children that they were caring for, and just not many resources, but they, they took a special interest in this boy, and they were determined to get him over the line to America. And we, he, they did. They did. He finds himself in the States. Uh, and, I mean, you've already given us uh, enough story to make two or three movies. <laughs> I mean, honestly, his life by the age of 14, so eventful, so wrought with challenge, and the fact that he's still standing up is astonishing. Mm. His whole next chapter of, of intermediate uh, recovery, you might say, transferring from slavery and finding a way to the States, and then he lands here, and there's a whole nother mm. uh, epoch in this story of his life in the States, adapting and adopting, and again, without any skill set. Um, one thing that strikes me in the story is just his name. Mm. Because when he gets to the States, he has to find employment and so on. And uh, tell us about his employer. Just, his employer just can't figure out Mitka, what mm -hmm. that kind of name is that. So how does he go? Um, he first arrives um, in the Bronx, and he spends several weeks at a synagogue. Um, he has moved to Catholic Charities because the synagogue was overflown in Baltimore. And... Uh, this wonderful man takes Mitka under his wing, helps him find work, but Mitka doesn't know what money is. He can't read and write, in English certainly, but in anything. He doesn't know what money is. He doesn't know any habits of work. And uh, Jim Libertini, who at the Catholic Charities, uh, had to teach him all of these really basic things. He was perceived as being 18, based on the fictional birth date that he had, when in fact he was probably 15. So... But everybody was expecting an 18-year-old to act like an 18-year-old. And, of course, he's not. But he, he's grown a lot then, and he's movie star good-looking. And he's got some charm and some uh, bravado. But um, he, um, at one of his employers, after being fired several times because he would get a little money from pay, he would go down to the theater, he could pay a quarter, and he could watch seven movies endlessly. And that became his teacher, American movies. Um, so he would get fired because he hadn't shown up for work. Uh, well, Jim Libertini kind of uh, put some fear in him and got him to continue at a job. The employer there uh, said, I can't call you Mitka. You're in America now. And so he named him Tim. And that became uh, Mitka's name. It began a process of keeping secrets. Um, Submerging what he understood to be his true identity in order to survive and make a way. He has to play along with other people's naming. 
It's a good way to put it. And and is it true that even at the beginning, when he was four years old, dropped off at the school in Ukraine, he didn't have a name? Correct. And it was only later. Well, he got a name from his slaveholder. Mm-hmm. What they called him, Martin. Martin Dur. Yeah, which was arbitrarily assigned, like the birthday. It was. <laughs> How did he discover Mitka as his name? That is something that happened in the rescue process. Yes, it was. Um, there was a time at the children's camp at Bad Eibling, where they're processing these uh, displaced children. Um, some, he heard someone say, Mitka. And he'd heard himself referred to as Dimitro or Demetrio, uh, but that didn't resonate with him. There were some records that we haven't been able to learn the origins of them, but there were some records that his name was Dimitro and that he, the nickname for that, Mitka, that's what he was familiar with. So someone said that and he knew in it, his it spirit, triggered a memory. It did, From and that early had, in his formation, yeah, they had called him by his name. It was the first time. It was one of those extraordinary, liberating moments for him. Um, but now he's renamed Tim, and now he's submerged that reality and plays that game mm-hmm. for a long time. And mm-hmm. and uh, we don't want to unpack the whole story because there's so much to discover. You need to buy this book, friends, but. He marries, he establishes a family. Here he is living in the States all these years, uh, moved out West uh, in his 80s, as you described. Of course, again, we, we speculate about his age. And something inside of him who has held the secret, I mean, does uh, even his family, do they fully comprehend his secret? And, and he wants to tell the story at the close of his life. Am I reading this right? Yes, you are. I mean, the secret lasted for 30 years. Um, He didn't tell his wife. She Uh, did not know. She did not know. Uh, She accepted that when she didn't know he couldn't read or write, he said, oh, I can't read and write in English. And that was the fiction that he used to uh, cover that he couldn't read or write. In any language. Yeah. She had, when, in 1981, he broke down, uh, he'd been holding, you know, he'd built a dam that held all of his early life back. Over and over in interviewing Mitka, hundreds of hours of interviewing him, one of the things that he continuously said was, I was a nobody. Who would want me? If I told her, this woman I've fallen in love with, if I told her my past, she would reject me. Even today, Stephen, she would reject me if she'd known. That's what he believed. That's what he believed. He kept saying, I was a nobody. I was a nobody. He was deeply ashamed. It brought to mind, again, how powerful uh, this emotion or this experience of shame is and how persistent it is over any good thing in your life. Shame becomes this dominant force. It did for him. And even a shame that he didn't earn. I mean, I'm ashamed of some things that I earned, Yeah, but he didn't earn shame. No. It's just something that clothed him. Well put. It was undeserved, and yet it was so, so powerful in him. Um, So I have to ask, I can guess the answer, but I'm going to ask it. The story is so over the top. I mean, so extreme. Your witness is the man telling the story of himself. How did you discern beyond his own just kind of capacity to persuade you that he was authentic? How did you discern that the story was actually true and not imagined or exaggerated or fabricated? It's a great question. Uh, I was blessed in writing this story with two associates, uh, Lynn Beck and Joel Lohr. Both of them are very accomplished scholars um, working. You know, in, one is now the president, Joel Lohr, of a seminary and uh, who had done great work, scholarly work, in Old Testament uh, areas. So from the get-go, as a team, 
we knew that we had to corroborate the truth of the story and the historical truth of it and the truth today, but that it, we couldn't write this and put it in front of anybody if we weren't able to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were, so Lynn and Joel, um, Lynn spent thousands of hours in uh, acquiring the research and uh, uh, you know, going through it, uh, thousands and thousands of pages, you know, dozens of books, and hundreds and hundreds of photographs. So it was a it was a long process to write this book because of the demands of finding the truth of this. Story. Research is a towering, yes. but there is context, and there are facts, and there are places and addresses, mm-hmm. and there is testimony that corroborates his story. I mean, I, I know that it has been published with that confidence. I mean, isn't it uh, the case that you've actually been able to trace back descendants of the family that enslaved him? Um, not descendants of them. I mean, we've traced, we, we know a lot about them, but we were able to find things that Mitka did not know about himself. And that was wonderful for him, of course, uh, particularly during his time at Bad Eibling. But in this process, uh, he found out uh, who his father was. He was a colonel in the Polish military and a decorated colonel who it is believed um, by his stepsister, whom he got to meet, uh, in that his father had a Jewish mistress and that he spent long time away from the family because of his military service, and that Metka was the product of that, uh, that love between the Jewish mistress and his father. Um, can't confirm who his mother was. It's one of the aching realities for Mitka of not being able to answer every question. Where was she born? Who was she? How did she die? We have some circumstantial evidence that she was burned to death um, uh, at about the time that Metka was left at the... Uh, but we don't know that. But if we couldn't confirm something, it's not in the book. Well, and uh, you you know my story, Steve. I'm an adopted person. Yes. My heart jumps, even though I had nothing of the harrowing experience that Mitka's had. That just the concept of question marks about your own origin. Each answered question is a piece of making you feel more whole, even if there are still unanswered questions. I, I'm just resonating with uh, what that must have been like for him to be able to pull some threads together that heretofore had not been yeah. available to him. But back to his story, knowing its authenticity, and again, I want to say thank you, Steve, for bringing this story to the fore, because it's, it's a compelling story, and the book is exceptionally well written so that it, there's, no, there's no dry moment. This is something you want to pick up and finish. But beyond that, it has so much to tell us about life, doesn't it? It does. And, and about the challenges of life, and while it may seem at some level far removed from any of our own experience, actually there are intersections mm-hmm. where, where I think anyone who reads Mitka's story, who unpacks his secret, mm-hmm. will find moments of, oh... I think I can feel that because I have had a taste of that. I would first want to ask you, how do you think that he survived? What was the source of his strength? Uh, Viktor Frankl, who's written elaborately about uh, this epoch of history and some of that sociology, you know, suggests that people who have a why can cope with almost any how. Mm-hmm. You know. What do you think about Mitka? Is his longevity a testament to something that's inside of him? Or was it just native luck? How would you describe his his inner strength that's allowed him to endure? Uh, it's something we've talked about and discussed so often. But there are some markers in his life that give us some clues about this. I think the first thing that I recognized was when he came to the farm... Uh, and as a slave boy, and he's taking care of these animals. The first day he was there, there were two guard dogs. Uh, One was named Molly, the other was Asta. Molly viciously bit Mitka in his upper left thigh. 
Um, he later made friends with Moli as he made friends with all of the animals. Um, caring for the animals, making them his friends, it was the only ones, the only persons that he could talk to. It was a relationship. It was a relationship. That was a piece of his ability to survive. There's another wonderful anecdote. One time he's down at the fields uh, where he's leaving uh, the manure that he collects uh, and for distribution across the fields. There are 17 to 29, depending on the time, adult uh, forced laborers, slaves, working at this farm. Mitka hears something and he says, it was the most beautiful thing I had ever heard. Here's music coming from an accordion. He said, I have to have that accordion. And I won't go into all the details, but he acquired that accordion uh, from that other slave. Um, and he taught himself in an attic hidden away over years how to play, proficiently play the accordion. He learned a march that's a common march of the Nazis at the time because he would see the soldiers goose-stepping through the streets and playing in the band this march. He, he mimicked that. But then he transposed it into a polka tempo, <laughs> which says a lot about his spirit. So the relationship with the animals, the beauty of music and what that did to him, um, and then he hears a disembodied voice at one of his lowest points at the home. He's walking by a window, and he hears in Germany, he hears the words, in the end, you will find your purpose. So when we think about Viktor Frankl talking about, if you know the why, then the how is possible. In this instance, I think those three, there's others, but I think oh, yes, those yes. three examples... Those are legs of a stool that caused yes. him to stand up. And yes. I'm, I just want to restate what you told me. He had a moment where he heard a disembodied voice. That's your phrase. Mm -hmm. He had something externally impressed upon him in a way he cannot identify. Mm -hmm. But the message was clear. Mm -hmm. If you know your purpose or in the... In the end, you will know, know your purpose. Uh, I mean, that speaks to a level of humanity mm -hmm. and human experience that's deeper than just the physical slog of life, doesn't it? Um, that, that Mitka, for all of the, the drought of education and formation in any healthy way, has a spirit that can hear. Mm -hmm what cannot be known physically. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary. He and believed that he heard God's voice. Yes. Even as a seven-year-old boy, or eight years old, perhaps, he, from the, the beginning, um, I mean, he'd not been given any formal religious education, That's but right. he believed... He has no he, context for no, it. It's just was, real. It was real. Yeah. And real enough for him to lock that up, may become part of his secret, but for him, it became a, an anchor. I have to say, though, the one miracle of your narrative just now is that the accordion became a saving grace. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, no offense to all those who love the accordion. <laughs> just imagining, wow, that's my, that's my stairway to heaven. I think uh, I, I... He still <laughs> plays that accordion And today. loves it, too. Yeah, of course he does. Yeah. Well, it's, it's striking to me that this book, and I, I need to hold it up, this book, and there's a picture of the young, younger uh, Mitka on the back, uh, this extraordinary story, which Steve, I think, has so much power and capacity, and it's just fresh off the press. Uh, it's not actually the story of... Uh, well, it, it's not the ordinary Holocaust genre, if I could be so... Uh, crass is to say it that way. There are many narratives from the Holocaust. Each one is an inspirational 
jaw-dropping tale because the, the horrors of the Holocaust were so grave. But uh, there's a sense that many stories are told of people who achieve a kind of notoriety surviving the Holocaust on the merits not of their journey in the Holocaust, but because they became brilliant in their professional discipline or mm -hmm. they moved into the arts or they had scientific genius or, you know, they, they made their marks apart from their Holocaust narrative and, and their story is told in that context and we see these triumphant, amazing outcomes. But Mithka's story isn't quite like that. No. His is a triumphant and amazing outcome. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about that, but in a different way. Mm -hmm. Mithka, you know, despite the horrors of what I'll call the first act, which is difficult for many people to read, but hang in there because the the second two acts are, are remarkable. He, um, um, where was I going here? Um, the, oh, he's redeemed. Oh, he is. Yeah. Um, this he was a laborer first all of his life. He is. He moved into a home in 1959 in Sparks, Nevada. It's a very modest neighborhood. It was a 800 square foot house. Uh, he's got at that time three children, toddlers, and uh, he and Adrian uh, moved into that house, the same house they live in to this day. His wife, Adrian. His wife, but um, over time. He kept adding on to the house, adding on to the house. So it's this lovely hodgepodge of add-ons, but he did everything himself. Um, another example of this man, he wanted his children to have bicycles. He couldn't afford bicycles. He went to junkyards and he found bicycle parts, old bicycles, and he would bring them back and put them together. So. Uh, we have a very common man in some ways. I'd say uncommon, even in his ingenuity. Absolutely. And his own capacity, his his thoughts mm -hmm. process. I mean, even, even back to his childhood, he throws himself while alive into the pit, mm -hmm. knowing that mm -hmm. that'll give him a chance to mm -hmm. live. I mean, mm -hmm. he's, he has to have a certain mental brilliance, yes. of course. But he has not been marked by the measure of success as the world generally calls it out. No. And yet, I think, Steve, you believe him to be a success because he has a quality of being that is not hinged on fame or notoriety or aggregate wealth. Yeah. There's not a Pollyanna story here in that not that he still bears scars and there's rough edges and he still suffers nightmares. But uh, to meet this man, um, I know it is just, he is, he has a joy. And this is a, you know, this is him today. Um, maybe you can get a little sense of that. Uh, he, I, I like to say that he does human well. <laughs> It's a great uh, phrase. Not everybody does human well. W we all want to. Yes. Um, Mitka, the symbol, he, he, you know, it's a lot, he doesn't envy someone who's done other things. He's so excited and proud of what he has accomplished. He's content in a way. He's, that's a great word. That describes it. He's very content. Um, he spends a lot of time telling and retelling his story. Um, if you were with him, even today, he wants to go back to specific episodes. And I, it, we've witnessed that. He tells it over and over and over again. It's how he makes sense of his world, uh, is to retell this story. It, um, and, you know, I think everybody wants to do that. We, we need to do that. Well, do you think it gives him a sense of freedom, mm -hmm. in a way, to be able to talk about it at last, mm -hmm. and and to be heard? Mm -hmm. I mean, is there a certain wholeness there? For so long, he lived in a secret environment where his story was something of which he was ashamed, mm -hmm. without cause, but it was real for him. And now to have the freedom to speak it, mm -hmm. and realize that other people are interested mm -hmm. in my story and who I am, I mean, there has to be a certain, like, purpose 
an affirmation in that? He spent the last uh, year and a half, really, uh, learning to sign his name for the first time in his life. And we spent um, two days with him recently at a book signing at Barnes & Noble in Reno, and it was a great turnout, and uh, they sold out of all the books they had. But sitting behind a desk like this, Mitka and his wife, and I next to him, and, and every time he signed his name, there was something very precious about that moment. I, could just, I was sitting there just... I, and. And it's difficult for him still to do that. And he only writes Mitka. Um, it's, it's a powerful, powerful moment when he, you see Mitka writing his name. It, <laughs> I mean, think about that. He's learning at his advanced age his own signature because a book has been written about his story. So compelling. <laughs> There's a humanity to this story. I mean, I think all of us are regaled by stories of survival and triumph. I mean, think about all the things we've seen or heard or read over a lifetime of, of great inspiration, what, what a person can do, what they can endure, and what they can overcome. This story, in its extremities, you know, at first blush, it seems like, oh my goodness, how could I even bear to read it? let alone connect to something in it. But as we observed earlier, Steve, there's something so genuine, authentic, and human in the story, even though the, the experiences are extreme, that we connect to it. And all of us have experienced twists and turns, circumstances beyond our control, um, difficulties, loss, doubt, shame. Uh, you have your own story to tell, Steve. Uh, as I said, we have some history. I know that your life, for all of the wonder of <laughs> of of the of the stage and uh, famous persons with whom you have walked and helped project and so on. I mean, for all of that, uh, no life is just an easy ride. You have lived this story. I mean, as as we talk about it, Steve. I mean, I don't have Mitka in the room, <laughs> but I've got <laughs> Steve, who's the next best thing because. You've spent so much time with him, and you've you've wrestled with the story so long that you breathe it too. I'm interested in how that's impacted your own sense of your own journey. How can you not experience what Mitka has, and then and then draw some kind of parallel to something in your own life? Has it has it changed you in a way, or encouraged you, or dared you, or or what? I think that. In large measure, it's revealed me to myself. Um, and that has been a wonderful journey. And it was made possible by having this intimate relationship with uh, this story and this, these two people, Adrian and Mitka. Um, I, I've been you know, so encouraged and, and pleased by... The comments we get back from readers, which match my own, that um, I read this book and I didn't expect uh, to find myself identifying so deeply with his story, even though mine isn't as extreme as his story is. And we've talked a lot about famous people, or we talked earlier about mm -hmm. the famous people. I've been around a lot of them uh, throughout my career. And... I we want famous people to be something we need them to be. Um, but beneath fame is humanity. Beneath humanity is pain. So... Well, I want to catch that again. Beneath fame, there's humanity. Mm -hmm. Beneath humanity, there is pain. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? I'll relate a quick story with my son's permission. Um, my children, their mother died at 42. Um, my youngest two um, were 10 and 12. A year and a half after that horrible event. She had cancer. 
she did. And it was a cruel, cruel death um, of unrelenting pain that could not be managed in the last 10 weeks of her life. Um, so at critical points in their lives, 10 and a 12-year-old, this, is, this was their experience. And a year and a half later, we were sitting in a village area outside the, the three of us. My older child was off at college, Jessica. We were sitting at an ice cream store. We were sitting out on the sidewalk and um, having an ice cream on a summer, hot summer evening. And uh, I looked at my son and I said, Carter, um, you aren't talking to me about what you're going through. Uh, and it's okay if you don't talk to Dad, but don't you need to talk to somebody? Nope. Carter, I think that it would be good if there was some way for you to deal with all that's going on inside of you. Nope. I'm getting frustrated. You know, I'm getting one-word answers. Don't you know I'm trying to help you? <laughs> yeah, from my 11-year-old. And uh, I said, so how are you dealing with it? He said, comedy. He said, son, what do you mean by that? He said, dad, if I make people laugh, it doesn't hurt so bad. Mitka learned a skill to make people laugh. And he was good at it and still is. But it gave him some distance from the pain. Uh, You know, it's really the title of a book for every comedian. But the point being, we all have experienced loss and pain to some degree. It's a universal component of humanity. Absolutely. And so... We need mechanisms to cope with that, to reconcile ourselves um, to many things, to grapple with forgiveness to, of ourselves and of what's been done to us. Um, to uh, One of the ways we come to terms with this is retelling stories. For me, it wasn't retelling my own story, it was writing Mitka's story which is an interesting thing because you bear witness to someone's life. That's what we want. We want significance. We want to be known, but then to realize that even in being known, we are loved. Um, Mitka has had that experience. In the end, you will find your purpose, God speaking to him. Uh, This isn't the end, but he has, in that life of eight decades now, more, uh, begun to realize that. Um, So the telling of his story has done something for him. It did a lot for me uh, or anybody who reads it in coming to terms with um, the the injustices that occurred in their lives. Uh, It's unfair what we do in our life. I mean, how we live out our lives. A lot of unfair things happen. It just is. Carter should not have lost his mom. Yeah. I mean, it seems unfair, doesn't it? Yeah. But that, yeah. there is that element to, to our journey. And, and Steve, I know you're a man of faith. Mm. And uh, coming to terms with uh, a loss of your wife to cancer, for instance, and and having these orphaned children, not orphaned, they had their dad yeah. still, but I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, there's so much in that. That's just one little piece of a pie <laughs> uh, of a lifetime. Uh, and and then you you dive into a story like Mitka's, which is, I was so fraught with wrong mm-hmm. and injustice, and, and yet he perseveres. But how, how does that, how does your faith grapple with that? Your belief that there is a God who is loving and good, uh, that he's represented himself to us in Christ Jesus. And I mean, as you're walking through Mitka's journey and then you reflect on your own, did it strengthen you? Did it cause you to have some shade thrown across your path? Or do you wrestle with it? Or you felt like, no, wait a minute. This is evidence of some longer thread that I can't see. How would you describe your faith's journey with Mitka's story? Let me go back briefly to 
an incident with Mitka, which is a metaphor for what I'm going to say. Um, we're sitting in this bookstore. He's signing his books painstakingly. Everybody's in awe of the man. They want to shake his hand. And there was a little break. Mitka turns to me, and he says, and he grabs me by the shoulders, and he says, Stephen, Stephen, I'm so ashamed. I said, Metka, why are you ashamed? He said, because now everybody knows I can't read and write. Everybody knows. My story is out there. <laughs> yeah, he'd been exposed. And I looked back into his eyes and I said, Metka, they know and they love you. I think for me... The faith piece that was so profound for me was the realization that my Creator and my Savior knows me, and I am loved. We, we all need to remember that, that we are known and we are loved. That is redemption. And that I experienced in certain parallels in this story that um, cause us to reflect on, our, on the parallels in our Absolutely. own stories. There, everyone has a story. And um, this, this act of telling someone else's story to give witness to their story um, and my wife says, that's an act of love. That's an act of supreme love. Because Metka needed to be named. He held secrets. When, he, when those secrets came pouring out, the, the truth of his life had to be established. And then he had to come to terms with all, you know, with the beatings by a common woman, a, a mother, who beat him relentlessly over and over as this seven- and eight-year-old boy. But now he is known, a deficit in his life. He can't read or write. That makes him ashamed. But he's loved, and he knows that. His value is not hinged on that. Yeah. You know, that I years ago, at a low point in my own life, I'm... In the business world, I'm making deals. It's transactional. Now, I'm, I'm around people who are doing things. I'm making deals for them. And uh, so I fixed on this concept that helped me sort through this. I drew two lines on a page, two vertical lines. I called one market worth. And I called the other line original worth. And at any one time, at that time, my market worth felt like it was about 15. But I could do some things to get it up to 20 or to 50 or to 70. But it depended on you know, externals. It wasn't who I am. My original worth was the worth God invested in me by creating me. And I destroyed that with sin but he restored it with a sacrifice to restore my original worth to 100 every time. And I got back to being reminded of how God sees me. Mitka sees that now, how God sees him. The story ends with his bar mitzvah. He's a 70-year-old man, 70-some, or 67 in that neighborhood. The, the right of becoming a man at 13, the little boy was returned to his manhood and to his faith. So extraordinary, Steve. Thank you. Thanks for being on All That to Say today mm -hmm. and again for this masterwork. And to our audience, when you 
are tuning this podcast out, your next step is to get in the car and go to Barnes & Noble or just go to Amazon. <laughs> Pick up Mitka's Secret because this is the most extraordinary tale that is not just something you'll read arm's length, but just as you've described, Steve, it's going to pull you in so that your own story is also changed for the better. You know, if you've watched our podcast today or you've been listening by your favorite uh, platform, be it Spotify or uh, iTunes, wherever you are accessing this, we want to encourage you to like us on that channel, subscribe to YouTube, for instance, leave a comment or question. We're always glad to hear from you if you're in a social media feed. Let me tell you, Steve Breyer, <laughs> so proud to know you. Thank you. I love you. I love you back. Yeah. Godspeed. Thank Get you. ready on that next book. All right. All right. <laughs> for more information, visit allthattosay.org. Thank you for joining the conversation. Don't forget to like and subscribe.